Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I was born with an unusual visual condition called achromatism, which means that I see in grayscale. So I've never actually seen color. I don't know what blue looks like or what pink looks like. I see things in grayscale. So as a child, I tried to ignore the existence of color, but it was impossible for me to ignore that color exists because people like you keep mentioning it every single day. So in daily things like uh, yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, Red Cross, Blue Tag, Red Bull, Yellow Submarine, James Brown, it's in his last name or this huge country called Greenland. So I, I keep hearing the names of colors and it's impossible to ignore the existence of it. Also, when color is used as a code, it can be a bit confusing. Hot water, cold water, maps. This is fine, but if I go to Tokyo, I can get easily lost because some maps only use color codes. Also, when I was trying to learn the colors of flags, I had this situation where three countries share exactly the same flag. And when I was talking to people, it was a bit confusing. If someone would ask me, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes and dressed in pink? I would have absolutely no idea because the only information I get here is that the man has hair, that he has eyes and that he's not naked, basically. <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to sense color is not because I wanted to see color, it's because I, I wanted to have this social element in my life. Seeing in grayscale has many advantages, so I didn't want to change that. I have better night vision, for example, I can see longer distances. Uh, I can memorize shapes more easily because color doesn't distract me from the shape. I can detect camouflages more easily because many of these camouflages are based on color. And also photocopies are cheaper in black and white, so this was <laughs> always an advantage. So I didn't want to change my sight, but I wanted to have a sense of color. So when I was studying music, I realized that there's been many theories relating color and sound. Isaac Newton created the theory centuries ago. So I wanted to take Isaac Newton's theory into practice. I, would, I wanted to hear the sounds of color. Both color and sound have something in common. They are frequencies. Color is a light frequency and sound is an audio frequency. So they both are frequencies. So we created the system that would allow me to hear the frequencies of color. Red, for example, is 420 millions of millions of waves per second. If we could hear that, we would hear a note between F and F sharp. So the system that we created in 2003 allowed me to hear the colors around me through sound. So I memorized the names that you give to each frequency. I memorized the sound of red. This is going from red to orange. And then we kept adding more microtones until I was able to sense 360 different degrees. So uh, one different tone for each degree of the color wheel. When I was able to sense all the visual colors, I didn't see why I should stop there. There's many more colors that exist that the human eye cannot sense, like infrareds and ultraviolets. So I decided to include infrareds and ultraviolets as well. So from that moment, I was suddenly able to sense more colors than the people around me. And sensing infrared is interesting because it allows you to know if there's movement detectors in a space, so you can tell if the alarms are on or off in a shop or in a bank, and in many cases they are off. So it's interesting to know that some of these movement detectors are not actually working. Ultraviolet perception allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe. If I sense there's a high level of ultraviolet, I avoid the sun or I put some sun cream. My aim is to continuously extend my color perception beyond the infrareds and the ultraviolets. When I started this project in 2003, I didn't want to use technology and I didn't want to wear technology. I wanted to become technology. I wanted to design myself so I could set color. I don't want to design a machine. I want to design a body part. So first I thought of designing a third eye that would be implanted in the middle of my forehead. But then I thought that this would limit my color perception to what I have in front. So then I thought that the best way would be to design an antenna, a human antenna, that would be implanted inside my skull and then it would allow me to feel the frequencies of color, the vibrations of color, through vibrations into my bone. So the aim was to create this antenna, and then when it was finally designed, I went to the doctor and I said that I wanted an antenna implanted in my head. And he said, sorry, we don't do this here. If you want to have this antenna implanted in your head, you'll have to convince a bioethical committee. So I presented this antenna to a bioethical committee and I told them that allowed me to hear the frequencies of color. So it's the dominant color, uh, the vibration goes into the antenna and then it makes my bone vibrate and this would allow me to hear colors. They said, no, this is not ethical. You cannot have this implanted in your head for three main reasons. One, because it's not not a pre-existing body part, it's not a leg, it's not an arm, it's an antenna, this is not a human body part, so that's not ethical for us. The second reason, because it's not a pre-existing sense, sensing infrareds and ultraviolet is not human, they said, so that's not ethical for us. And the third reason, they were extremely worried about the image the hospital would have if someone came out with an antenna sticking out of the head. 
So they said no to the surgery, but they helped me find a doctor willing to do it anonymously. So we did the surgery uh, on a Monday, that's the day off of the doctor, and we did it in a secret location. This is my head facing down, we removed the hair, and then my skin was reduced, and then my uh, skull was drilled four times for four different implants. One is this chip that now allows me to feel the vibrations of color around me, inside my skull. When I feel the vibration of color inside my head, it becomes an inner sound. So I still hear the sound of color, but through vibrations, in the same way that dolphins can hear through bone conduction uh, through a hole in their uh, jaw. The two other implants are to hold the structure of the new organ. And then the fourth implant is internet connection. So I can also receive colors from external antennas or external sensors, and people can send colors to my head via the internet. So the antenna and my head uh, took two months to merge, so now the antenna is part of my skeleton. So this is part of my mother body, so it means that I'm also officially taller as well, because this is part of my body, and I had to get used to the new, the, the new height as well. Uh, the internet connection, I use it to receive from five different places in the world. There's five people in the world that have permission to send colors to my head. They can do it using their mobile phones, so they can stream live images uh, from wherever they are, and then suddenly I can start receiving colors from other continents. So if there's a beautiful sunset in Australia, I could now suddenly be receiving these colors while I'm here. So I see this as the use of the internet as a sense. We've been using it as a tool or a communication system, but I think that in the future we'll see it more used also as a sense or a sensory extension. If my friends send colors to my head when I'm sleeping, sometimes they wake me up, or they can also color my dreams. So if someone starts sending yellow and I'm sleeping, my dream might suddenly become yellow, or a banana or a lemon might appear in my dream. So my friends can actually alter or color my dreams if they send colors when I'm sleeping. The internet connection, I can also use it since 2013 to connect to NASA's International Space Station. When I do this, my sense of color is no longer on Earth, it's in space, so I see this as a new form of, of, of space exploration. Instead of physically going to space, we can send our senses to space. Uh, so when I do this, I feel that I'm a senstronaut, because I'm exploring space without having to physically go there. Sensing colors from space is very overwhelming because there's lots of ultraviolets that I never receive here, but it allows me to actually discover new colors that I never feel here. I don't see this as AI. If the antenna was telling me the names of colors, blue, yellow, pink, that would be AI. I call it AS. It's an artificial sense, not artificial intelligence. Technology allows me to receive a sense, and then it's up to my brain to create the intelligence or not. So when we merge with ASs, uh, in the future I think we'll see many more ASs being created, and people will start merging with ASs. The intelligences or the knowledge will be created by the human brain. So we'll see human intelligence created by artificial senses. And the reality in which I live now, it's not virtual reality and it's not augmented reality. I call it revealed reality because uh, the merge with my body and technology allows me to reveal a reality that already existed. Sensing infrareds and ultraviolets is a reality that is surrounding us now, here. So by merging with technology, we can reveal many realities that surround us, like feeling where the north is, or sensing uh, ultrasounds, infrasounds, and many other elements that are now here but that we cannot sense. Uh, this is an MRI scan of my brain, so now I feel no difference between the software and my brain. That's why I identify myself as a cyborg, and that's what I tried to explain to the UK government in 2004, because they said there was a problem with the photo of my passport. They said there's, there's a law that says electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. They said I had to remove the antenna that I was wearing. I replied saying I'm not wearing an antenna, I have an antenna, in the same way that I'm not wearing a nose, I have a nose, and this should be true treated as an organ, not as a, a, a device. They replied saying no, so it became like a small battle in 2004 with the UK government. In the end, they said yes, and they allowed me to appear with the first prototype of the antenna uh, in 2004, and then the picture was renewed when the antenna was implanted. I am now in conversations with the Swedish government because the materials that I used to create the antenna are Swedish, so I'm telling them that I am Swedish because my body <laughs> is Swedish. So. So I think there should be a sixth point here that says that if you have a Swedish body part, you are also entitled to become Swedish. <laughs> I see all this as cyborg art, the art of creating your own senses, the art of creating your own organs, and the art of designing your perception of reality. 
And uh, one of the changes as well is the way I can dress now. I can now dress in a way that it sounds good. So if I want to dress in C major, I can dress like this. This is an, a minor chord, so I would dress like this in a funeral. Or I can actually design clothes so that it sounds like a melody. This is a, a, some of the clothes that I've designed that sounds like electronic music. In this case, it's Sega Bodega. Uh, transformed into a tie. So when I look at the tie, I hear electronic music by Sega Bodega. The longer the tie, the longer the melody. So I can decide which songs I want to wear. I've also had to make changes in some uh, fashion accessories. There's no hats for people with antenna, so I've had to create hats with holes in it. So we will see that the more people have new organs and new senses, there will be changes in the way we design clothes and the way we design other aspects of life. I can now paint what I hear as well. This is music transposed into color, note by note from the middle to the end. It's Mozart's Queen of the Night. So when I look at the painting, I can actually hear Mozart. This is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber. So it looks very different from uh, Mozart. Actually comes up very pink usually. I can also transpose speeches into color because when we speak, we use different frequencies. So these are two speeches. This is a speech by Martin Luther King, I have a dream. And this is a speech by Hitler. So it looks very different because they used very different frequencies when they spoke. The way I sense food has changed enormously. So the, the art of food is uh, something that I can now also explore with. I can compose music with food, especially with salads because they have many colors. So I can put food on a plate and then I can listen to a melody and I can eat a song depending on how I put the things on the plate. In, in order to share this experience, we've designed a chroma phone, which is designed with our restaurant Salle de Can Roca from Barcelona. And then you can go there and, and some of, one of their dishes will be placed on this chroma phone where you'll be able to hear the sound of the food. So maybe you'll be served some Lady Gaga dessert or whatever you want to listen. It will be served on this chroma phone. So now uh, I can compose music by looking at things. I no longer need to play an instrument simply by looking at different colors. I can actually amplify the colors from my head to an audience and these are called color concerts. So I no longer need to play an instrument. Uh, it's changed the way I perceive just walking around supermarkets especially because that's where I find more melodies. So for me, just walking around a supermarket is like going to a nightclub because there's so many melodies. Each aisle has its own melody, especially I, I really enjoy the zone with cleaning products. That's the most exciting area of a supermarket because it has very unexpected colors and very saturated. Saturation is transformed into volume. So the more saturated the color is, the more louder I hear it. So cleaning products are saturated. Milk is silent. So. It's not only supermarkets, I can now also walk around the museum and listen to a Picasso and I can listen to Salvador Dali. I can literally hear the scream because I can hear the colors of it when I look at it. So it's changed the way I perceive art enormously and also the way I perceive people because when I look at you, I hear your faces. So I really enjoy creating sound portraits where instead of drawing someone's face, I get close to the face and then I write down the sound of the eyes, the lips, the skin, the hair, and then I send them an MP3 of their face so they can listen to themselves. One of the first sound portraits I it was of Prince Charles. I asked him if I could listen to his face, and this was his reaction when I asked him. <laughs> we all sound different. Uh, Judy Dench has silent hair, for example. Uh, James Cameron has a very high-pitched sound of skin. Moby has one note less because he has no hair. Uh, Marina Abramovich sounds very low frequencies, but very loud. Uh, Macaulay Culkin sounds C major, so it's unusual to find someone that sounds like a major chord. Iris Apfel has a very, very high-pitched sound of eyes. Uh, Robert De Niro has a melody in his lips because he has different shades of red. Philip Glass sounds extremely microtono, and Bono had very loud glasses here. So we all have specific <laughs> soundscapes. What really shocked me through the years is that people who say they're black, they're not black, and people who say they're white, they're not white. People who say they're black, they're actually very, very dark orange, and people who say they're white, they're actually very, very light orange. So the fact that people say that humans are black and white is completely false. We are all orange. Thank you. This is just an example of a face concert. Sometimes I, I, I uh, ask the audience to cue and then I start creating rhythms with people's faces and then I create layers of electronic music through the colors of the audience. So the concert is created through color of the audience. So if the concert sounds really bad, it's not my fault. It's their fault because that's where the music is coming from. The last face concert I did was of Prince Albert II of Monaco and he likes the sound of his face so much that he's using it as his ringtone now. So whenever someone calls him, he hears the sound of his face. 
When I started this project 15 years ago, we had no idea if it would go wrong or not. Two possible risks were that my mind would not accept this stimuli and that I, I would have to stop. The second risk was that my body would not accept the new material. So in both cases, it didn't go wrong. Uh, it, uh, well, actually, the input, it took me months for me to get used to the new soundscape, but it slowly the brain got used to it. What I was not ready for was the social reaction. So since 2004, I've been stopped every single day in the street uh, by people who ask me what this is. In 2004, most people thought it was a reading light, so they would ask me if I could turn on <laughs> the light, or they were wondering where my book was. In 2005, six people thought it was a flexible microphone, like from an internet cafe. In 2008, people thought it was a hands-free telephone, so people thought I was on the phone. In 2009, 10, people thought it was a GoPro cam, that I was filming my life, so people would wave at me, <laughs> thinking that I was filming them. In 2012 and 13, uh, people started to ask me if, if I had something to do with Google Street View, that I was kind of streaming the streets. In 2015, children started asking if this was some kind of selfie stick attached to my head. And then in 2016, many people around the world just shouted at me, Pokemon, and they tried to catch me. <laughs> so it's uh, changed what people think it is. Hopefully, in the 2020s, it w people will just think it's a new sensory organ and it will be more normal to see people with new organs and new senses in the street. In 2010, I created the Cyber Foundation with Moon Rivers help to help other people that want to have new senses and organs uh, and also defend the cyborg rights, the right to design ourselves. And Moon Rivers is the co-founder. She's done several projects. She's a speedometer. By having two uh, earrings that allow her to feel movement, she can feel the exact speed of any movement in front of her. She also has two implants in her feet that allow her to feel the seismic activity of the world. So whenever there's an earthquake in the world, she feels a vibration in her body. She is now also connected to the seismograph on the moon, so she can feel moonquakes. Whenever there's seismic activity in the moon, she feels the vibration in her feet. So in the 20th century, we saw how humans went to space. Now we can actually bring space to our feet. Moon literally has the moon in her feet. Whenever there's a vibration in the moon, she feels it in her feet. So that's a way of sense turn out. Also, other projects we've done is bioluminescence. There's species that can create light in total darkness. You could also have light in total darkness if you had this small tooth that we created with a small light. So whenever you click, you have emergency light in your mouth. The problem with it is that when you eat, the light goes on and off. So we have to find a system <laughs> that won't work like this. We also created a, a system of communication in Brazil. A, a tooth uh, was placed in my mouth. Another tooth was placed in Moon River's mouth. And whenever I click, she feels a vibration in her mouth. Whenever she clicks, I receive a vibration in my mouth. We both know, learned the Morse code, so depending on the, on the rhythm, we can actually communicate from mouth to mouth. We call it the transdental communication system, <laughs> and it's a communication system that doesn't need any of your other senses. It's a system that would work in space, because there's no air conduction in space. It can also work under the water, and it actually works through Bluetooth. So it's a Bluetooth tooth that allows you to communicate <laughs> from mouth to mouth. This is the Transpecies Society. We are based in Barcelona. You can become a member if you want. We are uh, an association that creates organs and senses in communities, the social part of the Cyborg Foundation. We are over 400 members now, and we are creating all these senses and organs for people that want to explore uh, revealing these realities that surround us. We uh, create them all open source so that people around the world can actually collaborate and develop them further. Uh, Manel Muñoz is one of the co-founders of the Transpecies Society. He can feel the weather through uh, an, an ear that he's designing for himself that allows him to feel the atmospheric pressure changes. And we call ourselves Transpecies because we are adding senses and organs that are not traditionally human. So, uh, and I think that's something that we shouldn't be afraid of, not being so human. Like, uh, the definition of human no longer defines you if you add organs and senses that are not traditionally human. So we define ourselves as, as transpecies, and we think it's ethical to become transpecies, because we've not always been human. We started like being bacteria in the ocean, maybe then we became uh, something living on the earth, then we lived on the trees. Now we call ourselves human, but this is temporary. Now we have the option of deciding which senses and organs we want to have as a species. So I think we should embrace this as something normal. Also, I think what's wrong is that our species, for thousands of years, we've been designing the planet and we've been changing the planet in order to be more comfortable in it, and I think this is wrong. We should be designing ourselves and we should be changing ourselves in order to be better in this planet and stop designing the planet. If we all had night vision, for example, all these lights would be off uh, at night, 
Amsterdam would be completely dark and we would be spending so much energy creating light in total darkness. So this would be much better for the planet. If we could control our own temperature, we wouldn't use air conditioning, we wouldn't be using heaters, uh, we wouldn't be changing the, the temperature of the planet in order to be better. So I think slowly society will see it ethical that designing ourselves means that we'll have to design less the planet. Just to end, I just have a, a few seconds. Uh, I'm designing a, the sense of time, which is basically going to be implanted in my head and it will give me a point of heat that will slowly go around my head and it will take 24 hours to do the complete circle. So I will feel the 24-hour cycle of the planet in my head. My aim is to see if my body gets used to the 24-hour cycle so that I have an organ for the sense of time. Once my brain gets used to it, I want to see if I can actually change my perception of time. So if I want the situation to last longer, I'll make the point of heat go a bit slower so that I might feel that time is stretching. Or if I want to, time to go faster, I'll make it go a bit faster. So my aim is to take Albert Einstein's theory of time relativity into practice and see whether or not we can modify our perception of time if we have an organ for the sense of time. I think it should be possible because in the same way that we can create optical illusions because we have an organ for the sense of sight, we should be able to create time illusions if we create an organ for the sense of time. If it works, we could actually change uh, our perception of time whenever we want. We could also um, travel in time. If we make it spill se several times, we would, might feel that we are traveling in time. Or we could also change our perception of age. If I want to live 200 years, I can try to change my body so that my body lives 200 years, or I can trick my mind and make my mind believe that I've lived 200 years. So I'll try the second part so that maybe when I'm 70, I feel that I'm 200 years old when actually my body is just 70, so that I feel extremely young when I look at myself in the mirror. So thank you very much.